there's a habit in Christianity to overstate some things, to possibly, if you can accept this, exaggerate without really meaning to quite exaggerate the reality of what the person is trying to make the point of. For instance, I'll give you an example. People say today that, oh, you know, Christianity is failing, you know, in America. Oh, we're going downhill, you know. Our society is falling apart. We're not living according to, you know, the edicts and the precepts and the concepts that God has given us. Well, you know, yeah, I guess so. You know, if you look at the statistics or you look at the news, you know, and if you really focus in on some focus groups, you know, you kind of see that. I'm kind of weird, you know, I'm a little different, you know. I recently heard someone tell me, you know, and it was interesting, and I love the man, you know, and I, I agree with his point of view because of what he was pointing at to view. You know, he was trying to bring out a view of what's changed in our metropolitan society. And in metropolitan areas, the crush of humanity has caused certain crimes to be made more obvious by our information age. Because when we look at the news, <laughs> it's scary out there. Or is it? You see, I kind of grew up in a environment where I was running for my life. Literally, I was a little kid. You see, I grew up in a neighborhood that I was the only white kid. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I thought my mother was black because everyone that I saw was black. My mother was working days, and I had a babysitter that was black. So I thought my mama was black. As a matter of fact, Jack, that's the way it was for me, you know. And then when the riots came in L.A., you know, I was running for my life. Sort of. Not quite true, and I'm exaggerating for effect. But the point of it is, during the time I grew up, there were rough neighborhoods. There were rough areas. It was bad in our own way of looking at what was bad and what was good. I remember growing up in the time of the Vietnam era when, oh my God, what was going on in the country? Well, let's see, we had the Kent State Massacre. We had, you know, Chicago, you know, when they were marching in, you know, to take over the, you know, well, we won't talk about that. You know what Chicago's like. They got a murder every day. You know, it's kind of like, I remember a lot of things people seem to forget very quickly when they want to look at today and say, oh my God, how bad it is, you know, and if I want to focus in on how bad it was, you know, I go, yeah, you know, I kind of look around and I say, you know, it was pretty bad. I remember airliners getting hijacked, doesn't seem to happen anymore, you know, I seem to remember that they bombed the embassy in Washington, D.C., hmm, they haven't bombed an embassy lately, you know, oh yeah, they bombed the Boston Marathon. Gee, it sounds familiar. I think they did that in the embassy, too. You know, and I remember the Patty Hearst heist, you know, and that kind of like, oh, wow, the SLA. Ooh, we had those terrorist groups. Oh, we didn't call them terrorist groups. We called them, what? And you can pick your own. Oh, well, I remember, you know, even farther back. Didn't they have the Ku Klux Klan? Wasn't there, like, you know, witchcraft hunts, you know, all this, you know, satanic stuff that was supposed to be going on? Oh, and we found, you know, like bodies in the wilderness, you know, things going on in weird places. Hmm. And you know how bad corruption is? Of course, you know, corruption is horrible. I mean, it's disgusting. Oh, my God, look at our government. It's falling apart. It's so evil and so bad. Gee, I remember when they were injecting radioactive isotopes in some of the native tribes in Alaska. Huh. Wasn't that long ago. I remember when they were making and enforcing sterilization of handicapped people in America because they were handicapped. They were mentally incapacitated and they weren't able to have children because we don't want to pass that gene on in America. I remember state by state how the apologies were coming out one by one. You see, evil and the day of evil hasn't changed anything in the reality of where we have been or where we are today. Jesus prayed when he said the Father's Prayer, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. And that's kind of why some people exaggerate the times we live in. 
We do live in the last days. There's no doubt about that. The reason why we know that is different than what you would say or you think, because you know you say, well, you know, I remember when I went to school and someone told me this recently. And this, is, you know, I was going to say, I could have piped up and said, hello, you know, and I wanted to. I wanted to raise my hand and say, uh, can you ask me about that? You know, because he the the point was being made that you know we don't have to worry about kids bringing guns to school, and I went. Well, in my school you did. You had to worry about that. Matter of fact, they had what's called a closed campus in California for the first time in that area. The place was called Norco, and we brought a gun to school, and guess what? There was like the riot, they said, in Norco at that time. And they brought out the sheriffs, and they brought out the helicopters, and they surrounded the, the field, you know, where all of us had protested, and we had gone out into, you know, what was called this big field, you know, it was just part of the you know, kind of like grassy area, you know, and we were waiting for Corona, you know, to come up there because we had guns, you know, we had got our guns because, you know, after all, we lived in Norco. Now, I didn't own a gun, and I was out there just protesting anyways, you know, because it was kind of like a good way to get out of class. But, yeah, they found out there was a gun in the crowd, and at the same time, Corona drove by, and they found out they had a gun. Interesting. You know, and that was when there weren't supposed to be guns in school. I beg to differ. Hello. And I remember suicides, kids' suicides. I remember drugs in school. I remember all these things. Not much unlike today. Evil does exist. The signs of the times have been upon us for a long time. And I grew up with them. I don't know where everybody else was, but you know, hey, you know, I was kind of involved in this stuff. You know, I noticed things. I was more into the accuracy and the the reality of what school was like. As a matter of fact, the interesting thing was that I went to from Southern California to Klamath Falls, Oregon. Now, Klamath Falls, Oregon was a minor community up in Oregon, a real small community. It was kind of like a backwater, you know, and you know those kinds of towns, you know, like Andy and Mayberry kind of town, you know. It was kind of like old school, kind of like, you know, all so protected. And, you know, the churches were all kind of like, you know, small and intimate, you know. Everybody thought they knew what was going on in the town. So I kind of went, well, one time was this uh, outreach from Klamath Christian Fellowship was growing, there was a teacher that used to be one of our elders. And, uh, you know, Mr., I can't even remember his name, but I remember he was talking to me and he said, you know, I just really don't understand, you know, the people, the kids, you know. He says, you know, I don't understand this thing going on and this, that, and the other thing. And I said, well, I said, you don't understand because it's your point of view. You know, I said, what you see, yeah, and he was, he was a school teacher, you know, and he said, I said, what you see is one part of the picture. You're meant to see this part because you deal in this part of that world, and God wants you to use those talents for that ability. But I said, you don't see the other side of life. I said, me personally, I said, man, you know, I grew up on the street. You know, I said, I'm kind of like, you know, you know, kind of a little rough, you know, a little tough. Not really that I was rough and tough, but I was running for my life, you know, and I could fast talk my way out of trouble. Hopefully, you know, if not, I was in trouble. But I said, you don't really see the underside of Klamath Falls. I said, you don't know about the drug problems. I said, you don't know about the prostitution. I said, you don't know about all the other things that are going on in Klamath Falls, Oregon. He said, well, what do you mean, Michael? I said, do you really want to know? And I asked him that straight up. I said, do you really want to know? Because we can take a kind of like narrow-minded point of view. We can put on blinders and not see what's really going on in our society all the time. We can isolate ourselves in the Christian world to a degree where we keep far away from those people. Because you can stay busy in Christianity. You could stay conformable and comfortable with those that are of like-mindedness with you. And in a lot of ways, you should as you grow in the Lord. But don't be shocked when you get a reality check sometime. And so I took Mr. Darn, I wish I could remember his name. But he was really a dynamic man of God. And so I took him one time to this one place that I knew all the kids go because they could get in because they were drinking. And it was a, you know, bar, a tavern in Oregon, and it was some place that shouldn't be selling to children. I said, "Well, come here, follow me." Walked in, and his jaw dropped. There was his honor student, there was his, you know, kids, there was like, you know, the mothers, there was fathers, there was people, there was people all around in that tavern drinking. And his face went white. He was shocked out of his shorts. And I said, this is only one. 
said, Klamath Falls has a tavern on every corner. I said, as a matter of fact, some of them are even 50 feet apart. I said, what do you think people do at night? I said, they don't go home to watch television. In those days, you didn't have cable, and the cable that was coming in was very expensive. So these people couldn't afford it. It was farmland, basically, and kind of agrarian society, and also the only bigger city in the area. So it had all of its own issues. But it was also, as the Lord would show me you know, a long time ago when I first got there, a microcosm of the macrocosm of the world. And a lot of places are like that, you know, when they're isolated. They're, they're, they have their uniqueness because God wants to involve you in seeing something that he's going to show you in the greater world at large. And so I said, I've dealt with a lot of people in ministry. I said, they, they have the right idea. But I said, they're a little naive. I said, you know, it's kind of like, and I was talking about our pastor, you know, I said, he's, he's got the right idea. You know, but I said, he's a little naive about some things, you know, and I said, well, yeah, that's why we're here, you know, if we're older in the Lord, you know, because we kind of know some things, you know, we may not know everything, but there's some things that you needed to know, you know, and you needed to see. So I brought you in here, and there you go. You can see it. And he saw, you know, and then one girl staggered out, and she was like, you know, smashed out of her mind, you know, and he started talking to her, and he started sharing with her, and, uh, you know, took her home, and then she found out that she had been thrown out of her house, and you know, began to minister to her, and all, all kinds of things. Long story short, was that she died. She wound up OD. It changed his life. It changed his perspective. It changed his reality. He went so far as to begin a great ministry there in Klamath Falls, Oregon, but it also caused him to never be naive again about what he thought was so one-sided perspective. That's kind of what happens sometimes when we take only the bad news and we try to make it into something it's not, or we try to exemplify it if we don't look at it with real eyes, with the open reality of knowing what's going on. Our society has always had problems. There has always been issues. There's always this type of societal flux. You know, I, I recently read a, the same report that I was told in a Bible study about how Young people are, you know, doing this, that, and the other thing, you know what I mean? It was like, yeah, I read the report, I went, don't apply. What do you think was happening in the 60s, you know? They said the same thing. They said about the society was coming to an end because the hippies had taken over, and they believed in free love, so there's going to be, you know, the end of the world. Well, in a way, you know, it helped instigate the end of the world. But what started the end of the world was Israel becoming back in the line. And that's literally when the timetable started. You know, Israel became a nation. You know, again, the people that were not a people, that have always been a people, came together to be a people in one nation that God had promised would become a nation in the latter days. And so that's when it started. Bingo. Now, you could start that back in the 1800s when, you know, actually Herschel said, we have a nation. Today we are a nation. And then from 120 years later, declared Jerusalem as the capital of that nation, or you could start it from 67 or 48 or wherever you want to start it at. You know, there's all these different numbers and numerologies and kind of ways of people, you know, trying to nail down the time frame. Some of them are, you know, understand Jewish history. Some of them don't. You know, some of them can correlate Jewish history and Christian history together and kind of see a pattern going on at the same time, you know, what the Holy Spirit was doing. And you go, ooh, man, this revival was happening at the same time that this was going on? Wow, that's kind of interesting. I wonder why it's coincidental. But we won't go there. That's not what our topic is. Our topic is exaggerating how bad it is takes away from how good it is. You see, when things looked like there was no way that Christianity was going to survive, when there was absolutely no possibility of there being a Christian nation, I mean, after all, Time Magazine said it best. God is dead. Oh, wow. God's dead. I guess it's over. Christianity failed. The church has become a laughing stock. There is no more. You know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost took the last train for the coast. The day the music died and Don McLean was right. Or was he? You see, at the same time that man had said, oh, it's horrible. God said, Hey, Chuck, I want you to start something. Hey, uh, David Wilkerson, I want you to go to New York. Hey, uh, you know, Ron Reese, I got something in store for you. Hey, Greg Laurie, guess what, man? You're gonna, we're going to save you. You don't know that yet. And guess what? I'm going to reveal myself 
in these latter days in a revival that will never be like the world has ever seen and never will see again. And the truth is, the Jesus movement was that. You can deny it, you know, and denominations tried to absorb it, and I've watched over the years how they slowly have done this disinformation and misinformation to kind of reevaluate and kind of make into something lesser of what God did as greater. And I'm not saying that Calvary Chapel is isolated. I'm saying around the world you can point out in that time how these things broke out, out of nowhere, out of the hearts of people that have been praying. After, quote unquote, Time Magazine published, God was dead. And it's interesting because, you see, Elijah had the same issue. Elijah, you know, was kind of like, oh man, you know, here I've just had the greatest victory in the world, you know, I just knocked down, you know, prophets of Baal, you know, and everything else, and he's fleeing for his life, hiding in the cave, and he's saying, oh God, I'm the only one left. And God looks down and says, shut up, dude, I got 300, they haven't even bent the knee, what are you talking about, man, you don't know, you ain't got it, I mean, look at the big picture, come on now, let's get real, if I wanted them dead, they'd be dead, if I wanted them living, they'd be living, am I in charge or not? You know, Elijah said, well, are you okay? I guess that's all right. You know, and then he dealt with it. And that's kind of where I'm trying to say to you today. Don't buy into this end of the world routine. I mean, it is the end of the world. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I believe that, you know, the Lord's coming back in the next 10 years. No problem there. I can go there, you know, and give you a lot of prophecy about that. But not because society in America is suffering the consequences of Christians making bad choices. Because, you know, people say to me, well, I don't understand how the nation could turn around so fast. And I say, well, wait a minute, let me think about this. After the Jesus movement, we got prosperity for at least seven years or maybe longer, and we were like building second homes and third homes and fourth homes. And what was going on in those days? You see, I kind of remember this prosperity going on in all of Christianity and Christendom. And judgment begins at the house of God, doesn't it? And I kind of remember everybody taking this free will ride of enjoying their prosperity. Hey man, we got Christian television, we got Christian this, we got that, we got paneled houses, we got this and that and the other thing, and you know, we're going to just conquer the world in the name of Jesus. And then it became Christ, and then it became this, that and the other thing. And you really couldn't find, you know, quite frankly, poverty or the poor, because people weren't really ministering to the poor, until God decided, hey, there's some people you have here in America that you need to talk to. There's some people that are going to rise up, you know, and they're going to become an example of what I say you need to minister to. Whether it be the homosexual, if you want to use that, whether it be the black, whether you want to use that in the civil rights movement, whether you want to use the native Indian, or whether you want to use any other societal issue that we did not take care of in our prosperity while we were being blessed. But now we're being challenged because we reap what we sow. You see, this whole thing that's going on in society isn't because of God judging us. Because we reap what we sow. We planted it. What, what's the problem with the harvest? What did you plant? What do you got? What do you know? I remember Keith Green warning it. Hey. I remember Tozer saying it. Hey. I remember Schaefer saying specifically to America. Whoa. And David Wilkerson being the first one to adamantly tell us exactly what happened. Gee, Christians. Did we do it? Now, is that a bad thing? Well, you know, I mean, honestly, is that a bad thing? In my case, no. I think it's kind of neat. You know, I was watching, hey, you know what? You're going to reap the wind? So, reap to the wind, yeah. Or sow to the wind, reap the well road. You know, it's like, hey, prophecy fulfilled. Cool. Oh, yeah, you know, people are going to go do their thing and, you know, kind of neglect these other people. Hey, cool, man. You know, that's an object lesson. We get to learn these things. Oh, you want to not be so concerned about, you know, the Lord's coming back, but you want to be more concerned about, you know, hey, your 401k and your prosperity doctrine, you know, and everything else that's going on all the time, you know, we want to build these other little kingdoms and manifestations of the ministry, you know, do these other things and get sidetracked. Cool, you know, be sidetracked, you know, see what happens, you know, what kind of foundation are you laying, what kind of structure, wait till the wind blows, let's see how it goes. Whoa. We see, you know, oh, you want to stomp on, you know, Christians failing music industry? Christian music industry and beat up on some of the ones that aren't perfect? Whoa, where are we going to go with that? You want to start worshiping, you know, the feelings more than the fact and the faith? Great, where are we going to go to, Toronto? Whoa, rolling around on the ground, barking. Man, I said, okay, hey, object lessons. And that's what God wants to use in your life. Object lessons, everything in society is an object lesson. You're learning. 
He's in control. I mean, bluntly, he always has been. He's got the whole world in his hands. We had kumbaya moments that we knew all along, all the way through this life we were going to be challenged. We're going to go through kumbaya moments where it's like, hey, you know, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Oh, but then Roe versus Wade came along and there was abortion. Man, there have been abortions since day one. I mean, there's always been abortions, whether you knew it or not. If you go back into societal norms and you start examining what they had the little teas for or the little herbs for and how to get rid of a baby with those teas and herbs, there was a secret society of women going on all along. Ooh, dare we open that can of worms and find out. Proper Victorian society wasn't quite as proper and Victorian as we thought it was. Neither was American society. Or how could you commit a woman to the insane asylum because the man said she was insane? You see, there's always been evil about. But Jesus said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that's what we should not exaggerate that which is about us by focusing in on what is right and what is holy and what is pure and what is the answer to the evil age or the evil day or the darkness when we should be children of the light. You see, that's why we should be shining now, not whining now. And I mean, that's what amazes me. I hear more whining about how bad it is than I hear about shining about how good it is. Hey, this is great. Look how good we look now. We look wonderful because we are concerned about those things. Oh, wait a minute. What things are we concerned about? Oh, well, we're concerned about, you know, like, uh, you know, the president. You know, I mean, after all, you know, we're going to really affect the president. Really? You were that worried about that? And we're going to sign a petition so that, you know, hey, Chick-fil-A doesn't get persecuted. After all, Jesus didn't say that you're going to get persecuted for righteousness sake. He just said that you're going to get persecuted because those bad guys out there are going to pick on you. And we don't want bullying because we're a Christian nation. Really? Is that what you're all about? You see, I'm about something else. I don't want to isolate people and push them away. I want to bring them in and say, hey, check it out. The evil that we experienced as Christians and we're saying is going to happen will happen to you too. There are going to be things that are going to happen to you you're not ready for, but I am. So you know what? Bad things are going to happen. You know, like, hey, you know this whole argument about, you know, this marriage kind of thing, you know, and civil unions? Man, that was a simple solution a long time ago. Centuries ago, they already solved it. You know, we don't care about that. What we care about is what's going to happen when you deal with God? What's going to happen when your civil union, you know, or you gay marriages or whatever marriage you have suddenly runs into the reality of what a Christian marriage can't do either, which is survive. What happens when a gay marriage breaks up? Whoops. Wow, it's beginning to show too, isn't it? Or don't you know that? Oh, you didn't see the statistics? Wow, are you in for a surprise? Let them have what they want. Hey, God did it. We grows up with the terrors. Why are you so focused in on the wrong topics? Why aren't you giving an answer for the hope that lies within you? If we can't solve a Christian marriage, how are you going to solve a gay marriage? No offense. The reality of dealing with life, the reality of going through life, and the reality of facing death, and then the reality of knowing there's a living God and that you're going to stand before Him, ought to be the perspective that we share of every day of our life. Because the topics that we're focused on aren't really the topics that God is interested in. He already warned us. He already said things. Jesus told us all about it. But the perspective of helping someone, man, I don't care if you're gay, I don't care if you're HIV, I don't care if you're AIDS, I don't care if you're black, white, green, purple, or otherwise. If you're dying and going to hell, I don't want you to. I don't care if you're the president, I don't care if you're the pastor, I don't care if you're blown it, I don't care if you're doing it. I don't care where you are, I don't care what you've done, I don't care how you are. What I do care about is, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to fix it? when you're really screwed up. When you really need to call on someone, who can you call? Can you call Ghostbusters? I mean, really? You think that'll work? Can you call on the church anymore? You see, most of the time, you even can't call the church because, well, let me give you a questionnaire first. Uh, let me check your references. You know, I want to make sure that you're not manipulating anything. I want to make sure you're not a crook here. You know, I want to make sure that you're not stealing you know, or robbing or you know, going to rip me off or somehow deceive me. You know. Ooh, God help us that we should take some sinners, you know, and try to make saints out of them. 
Oh, man, that's like, you know, meet me on my terms and, hey, I'll help you. Or are we willing to go the extra mile? I wonder. You see, because that's what happened to me. I've had lots of people say all kinds of things about me, you know, and kind of look at me funny and go, you know, and kind of went, well, hey, you know, either I know the Lord or I don't. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> Talk to the Lord? Ask Him. <laughs> so I always finally said, I finally got to a place where I said, you know what? What am I supposed to do? And God says, tell the seed. Uh, oh, well, that's simple. Okay. See my frame of reference. See my point of view. See my perspective. See the person who called me and saved me in the first place. Deal with him. If you got a problem with me, talk to him about it. He'll fuck. He, he will fix it. He will find me. And he will change me. And that's where we all need the reality of knowing where we're going. Because we need to understand, you are going to be with me for eternity. If that sucks, I'm sorry for you because I am blessed by it. Maybe you'll rub off on me. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. And then again, hmm. And that's why we want to recognize, I want you to grasp this thought for a minute and get a real good grip on it. Who don't you want saved? Be careful. I know the answer. You probably have someone in your mind you really don't want saved. Now, I know Judas went to hell. I mean, you know, I don't have any problem with that. It's for a day, you know, or whatever, passed out. You know, he had the opportunity to be saved, whatever. But, you know, and I do believe in a hell, and I do believe in judgment. I do believe that we reap what we sow, and all those kinds of things, and God will judge accordingly. You know, that we've been given grace, and grace, you know, can extend. Even if you backslide, you can still be saved. You know, it's like, hey, don't worry about it. Or if you get divorced, or you go through whatever, even if you're one of those child molesters, can they be saved? Good question, huh? You see, that's where we get Jesus putting an interesting crew together to be his disciples. That's where we get an interesting perspective, an insight into what it means to be trained or taught or learned of God or learned of Jesus. You see, if we learn of Jesus, we learn that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Let's say God so loved the perfect people doesn't say God so loved the righteous people. Matter of fact, he said those perfect people, righteous people, let them do their thing. Leave them alone. Let them go. They're fine. No man can receive what they've received except to be given unto the mother of the Father, which is in heaven. So if they've received of their Father, let them do their thing. Let them go be their thing. Let them be blessed and encouraged. Just don't go with them. That's the way it is. It's the way I was raised in Calvary. It's the way I was taught. And the way God has taught me to be in my life as a Christian. But if we learn of Jesus, we learn that he loves the world, that they who are of that desperate nature, whether it be a homosexual, a murderer, a thief, a carpetbagger, an Indian chief, whatever it may be, is desperately wanting something more than what they got. And so they go out and try to get it full of, full of something, the same way you try to in some way to get to where you are today, if you are saved. If you're not saved, hey, got news for you. You could be, if you want to be. Do you want to be? No. Okay, go to hell. That's simple. I don't think you want to be there, but you know, when you get ready, come back and I'll tell you all about it because you don't want to go there. But that's what you need to think about if you are, dare I say, in the ministry. Who are you pushing away when you make your stand? Who are you forcing away when you declare your own limited view and perspective of what something is instead of what and who God is. You see, God is love. God's not surprised by where we're at. God doesn't shock, you know, therapy us by saying, oh, wake up, guess what, the world's ending. You know, no, he says, look, it's going to happen in a natural process. You're not going to be shocked one day to wake up and suddenly discover the end of the world is here. No, it's going to progress, as I said it would. Step by step, you're going to see it like birth pains. No woman wakes up in 24 hours and says, oh my God, I'm pregnant. No. It was natural. Month by month, week by week, she didn't go through this idea that suddenly she's going to discover, you know, at the end of her pregnancy that she was pregnant all along. I beg to differ with you. That's the way the end of the world is. 
it's not some mystical, magical, you know, you got to work it up to believe in it kind of thing. It's going to be smack you in the face kind of big belly time reality. And you ain't going to feel good because, you know, somewhere along the line you're going to be doing one of these numbers or, you know, going to be bleh, one of those numbers and it's going to be like, I got pregnancy. And then when the baby kicks, oh man, you know you're pregnant when that happens. So that's the same way Jesus said, look, that's what the inner world is. It's like, you know, when we're being pregnant, you know, it's got a sign. These are the signs, you know, you can watch for them, you know, and you kind of know that it's happening. Then suddenly it's going to be a happening, you know, and it's kind of like, ooh, okay. Kind of like inception began, you know, bluntly. If you want to know an actual physical date, over 120 years ago, you know, about you know, 67 to 2013, I think it's 46 years, I can't remember. But anyways, you pace it back to back with Herschel, you know, and then that's where the Jew, is that when, you know, Israel became a mission. The reality of it actually being accomplished, just like kind of Nehemiah, the edict went forth, and then it was accomplished when? When Jesus, you know, later, temple, her temple, Jerubbabel's temple, you know, the edict went forth, Nehemiah and Ezra and Jerubbabel, then they built, they started the walls, then they built the walls, then they built the temple, then they began the sacrifice, then the sacrifice, you know. Well, it's kind of like end time, same thing, you know, they're building a wall around Jerusalem now, you know, they're building a wall, notice the wall, you don't know there's a wall being built in Jerusalem? Israel kind of making the walled cities, you know, kind of like what the prophecy said. And then also Jerusalem being walled about with paneled homes. You don't know that? Oh, well, that's what the home construction is. And you know that there would be this, um, you know, um, well, say Nehemiah and Ezra and the edict went forth and that they would be building in a time of turmoil and a time of, you know, of uh, the enemies attacking Nehemiah and he would be praying and building the wall, praying and building the wall. Where do you think we are today? You think Syria is happy about Israel building the wall? You think Jordan is sitting there going, hey, you know what, that's kind of a nice little wall, you know, or that Gaza or that, you know, the East Bank, the West Bank, or that, you know, Egypt is all kind of like, you know, thrilled to death to see Nehemiah being fulfilled right in front of them? Or are you reading the Bible? Are you seeing that? You don't see that? Oh, well, guess what? It'll get bigger. It'll get more obvious. It'll become more pregnant, you know. Temple. They start, so they start sacrificing animals, you'll know. Don't go by some of these things that people say. Go by the reality of what they do. You know, there's a Temple Mount group that's kind of a wacko group, you know. I mean, it's a nice thing to look at for a tourist item, but it's not true. That's not what they're going to do, you know. It will be, you know, the Orthodox Jews that are kind of like, in the temple, you know, they, they have a pedigree, you know, not the Temple Mount Institute. They're kind of, you know, even by Jews, they're like, mm. So, knowing those things, that these were going to be accomplished, God said, so what are you worried about? He says, that's the end of the age. He says, but you focus in on what I'm telling you to do. Heal the sick, raise the dead, freely you've received, freely give, go out, prove this. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Make disciples of all nations. And in your learning process, discover what God is. Because there's not anyone that God is not willing to die for or he would not have died in the first place. There's not anyone that God cannot save because his arm is not shortened nor his ear hardened that he cannot hear and reach down from heaven and save a soul or change a man's heart or turn the heart of the king in whatsoever direction he chooses it to go. Because whether you know it or not, God is revealing your heart by what we're experiencing right now in this reality of our nation. It's not about just praying for the nation and wanting a revival. I don't want a revival. It ain't going to happen. That's obvious. Jeez. I want a, a renewal so to speak, I want a repentance, yes, of course. You know, people that have been turning the wrong way, how about turning the right way? Get away from all these kind of like political maneuverings that you're trying to do. Trying to say politics? Good God, you know, we've been doing that for centuries. But get into what God wants you to do. You know, and if He was wants you to do in politics, hey, you know, then tell me the Lord said. You know, the first time that, you know, somebody came up to me as a pastor and said, vote for a Mormon, I said, let me ask you a direct question. Did you pray about this? You know, because I really wanted to know. I just asked them that. You know, I said, did you pray about this? They never answered. So then I asked them directly. I said, so did Jesus tell you to tell me to pray or to vote for a Mormon? The person said, well, no, because, you know, Jesus doesn't talk about democracy and how to vote. He just tells you, you know, like, stuff for the kingdom, not for the country. I bit my tongue. <laughs> Not. I slammed him to the ground. I stomped on him. I rumped on him. I chomped on him. 
Man, <laughs> you betcha, baby. <laughs> it was all over in three sentences, you know. <laughs> you know, and God said, well done, that good and faithful servant. Not. <laughs> I had to repent for a week. <laughs> Maybe a few months. <laughs> Oh, Lord, I'm sorry, but it was so tempting. It tasted so good gnawing on that bone. Oh, man, I'm still chewing on it. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> dare I say it was too much glee. But what God wants us to be is focused in on Him and what He tells us to do. So what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Raised up together in Jesus, fear not. I am He that liveth. Father, I will that they also, whom you have given me, would be with me where I am. We are members of his body and of his flesh, and of his bones. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. You are complete in him. Period. Hey, what am I lacking? You are complete in him which is the head. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them through fear of death, where all their lifetime had been subject to bondage. Oh my God, if I do that, I'm going to die. Cool. I'm a withering testimony about no fear of death. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must be put on immortality, so that when this incorruptible, when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall be put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, 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 it's written and written, that death is swallowed up in victory. I'm a testimony. Hey, you know what I know why? I faced death. Man, I was told I wasn't going to live past 30. So, where'd he go? What happened? Dude, I'm here. Get a grip. You know, I've seen a lot of Calvary pastors go through this challenge of their loved ones dying. You know, and I, my heart goes out to them, you know. My mother's dead. <laughs> we didn't cry. Oh well, sort of did, but not really. I was kind of like, all right, cool, gone. And some of them, you know, I mean, it, it tears you up, you know, the loved one, you know, there's, there's a mount of mourning and awe and, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, and you could call me compartmentalizing. Or you could say that, hey, you know, I'm not really all that shook up about it. Um, <laughs> if I'm being honest, death, where is thy sting? I don't see any sting. What's the bad out of it? I don't see any. <laughs> For a Christian, there's no bad in dying. There's only good. You're there. Wow, cool. It's over. I won. I've finished the course. I've run the race. I was laid up for me a crown that I'm given. Ha ah, ha. Woo. Yeah. We got the victory. You know, let's Tebow it. But why, knowing you don't have to fear death, why, if you are complete in Him, why, if you have all these things, including Jesus Himself, are we so wrapped up in what's wrong with the world? How about what's right with us? Check it out, man. I got a new suit. You know what it's called? Mercy and Grace. Man, I'm bipping and bopping and weaving and whopping and rapping and japping and talking and living and going and flowing and knowing and showing the grace and the mercy of God that I'm forgiven daily because I need it. I got to be forgiven because I need it. I got to live by grace because I need grace. Because if you've seen this face, it's on a wanted poster. By God. Got you there. You thought I was on the post office, didn't you? <laughs> no, I haven't been that bad. Not lately, I don't think. Have I been that bad lately? Give me a minute. He's smiling. I must have been good. Call no man good, except for your Father which is in heaven. He's the only one that's good. And so, you see, we got to get this grasp of who we are so that we can talk about who he is and what he's done because when you really know who he is and what he's done and then you know who you are complete in him you got something good to talk about hey man remember how bad i was dude you know like i'm still pretty sucky guess what i still get to go to heaven not because i'm better 
But because I'm working on, well, he's working on me, you know, and I'm working with him, you know, and we're kind of like a joint, you know, project, going to be completed in eternity. <laughs> you want to see those completion signs about, you know, who's funded by? Funded by Jesus Christ. This project is in construction, and it will be completed on that day of redemption, you know, when he takes me into heaven, you know, and this corruption puts on incorruption, and this mortality puts on immortality. And I stand before him and say, thank you. I got tired of fighting my own flesh. And that's the only battle you have. Really. Your flesh. Hey, you don't got to worry about Satan. He got busted already. He's been beaten for a long time. You don't got to worry about, you know, like, the country. Hey, it's in God's hands. It's always been there. Always has been. Always will be. You don't got to worry about your monies or your anxieties or your fears, you know. Okay, maybe a little bit. I do. <laughs> What am I going to eat tonight, Lord? Top ramen again? Man, I want something other than manna. Can I not have manna? I'm getting tired of top ramen, Lord. I want more than manna. I want partridge. <laughs> and here comes this flood of birds. You know. Oh, no, Lord. You mean I got to learn how to cut them and clean them and do all that stuff and then barbecue them? Bring them on. I'm ready for meat. <laughs> but are you? Are you ready for meat? You see, you've been bottle fed for a long time in this country. You've been really given a lot of kind of like mush and gush. Are you ready to suffer and die? Are you ready to live by what you say you believe in? Or are you going to keep blaming and whining on something that isn't really what God said? Are you going to keep picking your topics and your choices of your own accord and try to say something that isn't going to be saved? Are you trying to construct an America that you call a Christian America into the image of what you want it to be which is reality a deceptive process that Satan has brought along with these kingdom makers, you know, that this new doctrine and this new philosophy of how the millennial kingdom will come about is by our own efforts, because we're going to make America be that millennial kingdom with Jerusalem, you know, we're going to be north and south, you know, together, collected, you know, well, he'll be east and we'll be west, and you know what, we got the whole world as part of the nations of all the kingdoms that Jesus will rule from Jerusalem in. No. Not according to this. Sorry, you don't put America in the Bible when it isn't there. No matter how hard you try. And I got news for you. No matter which biblical scholar you go to, you want to put him in my backyard, I'll argue with him. I'll give him it. You want to put Mr. here, we'll talk. Be a long conversation. <laughs> I, I talked with Mr. <laughs> you know, I remember going to his studies. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, okay. You know, I was listening more than I was talking, but... I'll talk now. You know. <laughs> we'll argue. <laughs> okay, we'll debate. <laughs> we'll talk about it. You know, we'll relate. You know, but yeah, I mean, but the point being is that no, you don't put America into prophecy. Prophecy is the revelation of Jesus. You put Jesus in America because He's always been here and always will be. As long as there's one Christian in America, you have a Christian nation. As long as there's one Christian alive, you have the salvation of the world. As long as there's one Christian who's turned their heart towards God, then the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro, looking on whom to his behalf, that he can act strong on their behalf. And that's what Noah was. That's what Abraham was. That's what Isaac was. That's what Jacob was. That's what every single hero you have in the Bible, that God chose them, picked them, Chuck Smith included, A.W. Tozer, Keith Green, you name some of these great names that you can remember, or if you don't even know what they stood for, oh well. But they had the reality of having to stand against the tide and say, no, it's not over. There's one, and if I'm one, there's 300 more out there, according to what God said. And I'm not going to let the living God be damned by any man saying that the world is coming to an end because Christianity is failing or the church isn't succeeding. I'll be a monkey's uncle before that, and I'll claim creationism and go with Darwin. <laughs> before I'll deny the living God who intervenes in the reality of man he always has his witness he always has his sign when God can't use us he'll use someone else when God can't use the church he steps outside the organized church and still has the body of Christ because he is the head and we are complete in him and we are part of that heritage that godliness, that manifestation that this doesn't matter whether you think it's dark out there or whether you think it's light out there. It doesn't matter your perspective. What matters is what you're receptive of. 
And are you willing to receive God's word spoken to you directly and for God to tell you what to do today? Then concentrate on that. Do whatever it is the Lord your God has told you to do. Be what Jesus wants you to be and learn of Him and walk with Him and talk with Him. Live your life humbly. Love mercy. Seek to follow God in a humble, merciful way. Be forgiving and be forgiven. Give grace and receive grace. Be merciful and receive mercy. Don't judge. You won't be judged. It's not hard. It's not a great reality check. You don't have to make a fight every time you hear something that's wrong in order to be right. Sometimes it's just be in the light. Hey, I kind of like that way. You know? I see two people fighting and I walk up and I'm very peaceful. I'm like, really? You want to do that? Okay. Enjoy. You knock their blocks off and then by the time they're done, you know, you buy them back. You band-aid them up, you know, and you kind of like cover their wounds, you know, and you try to heal them, you know, kind of like what we do with the military. You know, we, we claim that, you know, the military is, you know, godly. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it is, you know. And so what happens when they come back? You know, they got PTSD, they got problems, they got realities, they got issues, they got families, they got problems and things that have gone on because we reap what we sow and we've gone to the violent end and that suffer, the kingdom of God suffers violence but the violence taken by force. So guess what? You still have to deal with all those kind of forceful, violent things that are going on in the world and that issue of violence and the world being filled with violence that we think we got to protect ourselves with our armies and our navies and our marines and our, our pride you know, and our egos so that we go out and do things where we shouldn't have been doing things we shouldn't do. But, oh, it's okay because, you know, we're going to ask God to bless it too. You know? But then we have to deal with the consequence. And, you know, that's what a Christian is. He's the healer. He's the hope. He's the one who heals the sick, raises the dead, freely has received, freely gives, is the answer for the hope that lies within that person who's enjoying and rejoicing in the times that they live in, not whining about what they don't have in the signs of the times.